and welcome back to our second cornerstone of the day here at our Roundtables Europe. Over the next two hours, we will be looking at due diligence and compliance issues in the world of solar asset management. On this event app, you can get engaged and become part of the debate by prompting your questions to our experts. And you can also upvote the questions of other viewers. Uh, Michael, you will be supporting me during the panel discussions with handling the audience questions. And uh, during the first panel, that should be rather exciting for you. Isn't that right? Yes, indeed. At the first panel, the key word is sustainable finance. There is a whole bunch of regulations in the EU which are not easy to keep track of. And now it's really time to dive into this new finance world as there are some important dates when these regulations become effective. And there are often on one hand, there are the positive effects, so we can expect more financing for solar. But what we learned during our research for our magazine articles, which we have published in the recent months, it will also affect solar project developers and asset managers and investors with new obligations which go f further than just letting sheep graze below modules or adding biotopes. So the question is what sort of obligations will come, we, we will have to consider, not immediately, but I would think as usual with such developments, they come faster at the end than we believe. Well, this debate is coming up shortly, uh, but now onto this session. Uh, over the last 20 years, the solar industry has made an astonishing transformation. New technologies have entered the market, new standards have been set, and photovoltaics grew from a niche application on the roofs of pioneers to steadily and determinately taking over the baton from coal and gas. Uh, PV is increasingly market-driven and runs on even tighter margins. Uh, to, to be successful in such a competitive environment, a smooth operation from planning to decommissioning is an absolute must. Uh, which is why, in this session, not only do we want to look at some of the common challenges solar asset owners face during a plant's lifetime, but we also want to discuss what can be done to weather those challenges. Uh, we will begin with due diligence processes during the investment and planning stages uh, with which solar asset starts. Um, but uh, after this, we will also discuss best practices during the commissioning stages and learn how performance guarantees for bifacial projects allow for easy financing. And also on the program, how to ensure the safety of single access tracking installations. A small hint, vendor choice is a start, but it's not everything. And lastly, we will also uh, tackle the aches and pains of solar plants after they've reached a certain age. Backsheet failures continue to plague the industry, uh, for that there's quite a hassle to address this issue. Uh, but light is on the horizon. Revamping and repowering is becoming a multi-gigawatt task for the European solar sector, uh, but there isn't really a universal rule book on how to tackle this issue. Or is there? Yes, and before we dive into the program, we want to say special thanks to our networking partner, FEMA. We have arranged a lot of networking sessions in different languages, in English, of course, but also in the languages of our other sites, so German, French, and Spanish. And some of those also will have special guests, for example, in the German, net German networking session at 4 p.m., so right after this session now, you can meet an investor discussing experiences, how to achieve community acceptance for solar plants. Um, there are also more networking sessions tomorrow, for example, on aquivoltaics and on hydrogen scattered for tomorrow in the morning and in the afternoon. That's correct. Uh, and you can discover the whole program, uh, the networking sessions and the meet the speaker session here on this event app. Uh, top tip, if you open a second browser tab to run this app twice, you can continue watching what's happening here on the main stage uh, while browsing through the program and discover all the plenty of opportunities that we've prepared for you to connect and get involved. Um, for example, we have also organized a play to win scavenger hunt, uh, test your knowledge on the solar industry and win prizes like meeting our publisher, Eckhard Guras. Uh, you can also win subscriptions on the magazine uh, or you can win to place ads on our websites or in the magazine. Um, if you have any trouble finding your way through our event platform, don't hesitate to reach out uh, to us at the info booth and we're happy to help you in no time.
A special thanks also to our partners who have made this event possible. Uh, we're glad to have on board our platinum partners, DuPont, Goodwe, Grovat, Jinko Solar, and Smart Energy. And uh, DuPont, Goodwe, and Jinko Solar, you will also see later in this session here on stage. Uh, and also a big thanks to all our gold and silver partners, uh, as you can see behind me. Um, Yes, and if you cannot stick around for the next two hours or also tomorrow, don't fret. We have prepared a live blog of the event on our websites. Also this, not only in English, but also on our regional sites, German, French and Spanish. And of course, you can live blog yourself and become part of the debate on social media. Uh, if you do that, why not use the hashtag RTEU21? But for now, a big thanks again and jo for joining us. And with no further ado, we'll jump into our first segment of the program. We begin this sustainable uh, roundtable session with sustainable finance regulations. Over the last weeks, many project developers, asset owners and investors uh, will have faced terms like ESG taxonomy, do no significant harm and sustainable finance disclosure regulation. Uh, but what do these actually mean? How do they work together and what are the critical aspects that stakeholders of the solar industry need to watch out for? And why should solar, the solar industry care anyway? How can a solar project not be sustainable? To answer these questions, we will be hearing first from Carsten Auel. He's the Senior Manager for Sustainable Finance at Deloitte. Ah, thank you for joining us, Carsten. Yeah, hello from my side. Good afternoon from uh, Frankfurt. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, present the latest update on sustainable finance covering the taxonomy regulation as well as the sustainable finance disclosure regulation. So in the next minutes, I hope to give you a good overview of of what will happen. I will try to drill this down. Typically, these um, uh, discussions can take up to two or three hours, and we will really uh, dig into the main points within uh, the next uh, minutes. And uh, for that, we have um, prepared a small presentation that hopefully you are able to follow. So the first question is obviously, why? what is the taxonomy? What is it about? Why do we actually uh, need it? And the idea about the EU taxonomy is that it is the backbone and it provides a unique classification system for what is environmentally sustainable. So the focus is on the E uh, for environmental. And here the idea is basically that you have six environmental objectives and we are always looking on uh, two different things. We are looking on uh, the activities that are creating an issue and we are looking on how we can transform them to be sustainable. And we are looking for the ones that actually are sustainable already. And as you can imagine, uh, at the moment, we are talking about the first two environmental objectives. So this is climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. And here, quite obvious, uh, solar plays a, a large role as a renewable energy. So this is an energy we will uh, need in the future. And then the taxonomy will provide uh, information about what does uh, solar need to achieve in order to be uh, sustainable. And um, it was already discussed in, in the last minutes uh, that it, this may be a bit new because so far we are moving a bit now from green energy to um, sustainable energy. Okay, so the, uh, the taxonomy works the following way. First of all, you need to make a significant contribution to, um, to one of the environmental objectives. And then the idea is that also you, is, that you ensure that you don't do any harm to any other environmental objective. So it, quite easily, when you're building um, a, a solar plant, you need to take care, for example, about biodiversity. So uh, this is also a very important part that you do not only consider one environmental objective, so creating um, clean energy, but you're also looking if, I, if you're creating an issue with any other environmental objective. And then the third one, also very important, is minimum social safeguards. So in, in your value chain, what you need to check is basically uh, are human and labor rights uh, uh, kept in place? Is, is everything... Um, uh, aligned, for example, are the OECD guidelines uh, kept or the UN, um, the UN principles on business and human rights? You see the ones on the bottom, they are clearly described and you need to ensure that basically you're not um, 
you're not creating any issue on human rights or um, yeah or labor. So what we show on on this slide is um, basically you have criteria for solar PV technology and then for CSP. Um, so in general, they're quite similar. You see there is only basically one major difference and that is um, in the DNS age of water. So you see in the green boxes, uh, solar is automatically uh, deemed as having a significant contribution to climate change. In During the development of this criteria, it was discussed whether there should be uh, um, a limit of 100 grams CO2 per kilowatt hour, but it was dropped. So right now, automatically, solar has a significant contribution. But what you need to do is you need to perform um, a physical risk assessment based on um, based on climate change adaptation. So do you have any physical climate risks on the um, on your um, um, do you have any physical risks? And you need to do according to NXE also a biodiversity. Um, assessment. So, um, and then for CSP, you also have the DNSH concerning uh, water, where you need to check if you have any, uh, if there are any risks related to uh, water use or water degradation. So, this is what you all have to fulfill in order that solar in the future is sustainable. And on the top uh, around this, please don't forget the minimum social safeguards. And then very shortly, um, only um, uh, about half a minute about the SFDR, so the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, and that is what fund managers are currently talking about. And fund managers uh, need to take on two perspectives. They need to understand, first of all, the impact of uh, sustainability on their financial products. But also, and this is a game changer, they need to uh, also control for the negative impacts of their financial products on sustainability. So do they have large CO2 emissions in their portfolio? Are there any uh, violations of human rights and so on? So what you will also see is that for investment managers, this transition will also be very important because they need in the future to understand what is the impact on sustainability on their project, on their, on their products, but also they clearly need to um, adhere to the fact that uh, maybe there are adverse impacts on sustainability that their project, uh, that their product is basically uh, linked to. So I hope this short introduction helped you to get a bit of understanding. In case you have any questions, please feel free to raise them at any point of time. And I'm looking forward to a fruitful um, panel discussion right now. Thank you. Thank you, Carsten. So am I. Thank you for this insightful introduction um, to these multiple new legal instruments and what they mean for the solar industry. Uh, as we can see, there are multiple uh, regulations and, and we want to bring on stage uh, some panelists uh, to see what the operational impact of these regulations are. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Julia Gidi. Uh, she is the head of ESG at Investment Manager Next Energy Capital. And also we're going to bring on stage um, from the independent power producer and carvers, uh, Tanja van der Wauer. She's the head of communications and sustainability joining us here today. Also viewers, if you have any questions, uh, now's the time to submit them uh, through the event app and we will try to bring them as many as possible to our experts. Um, we have heard uh, from Carsten uh, what these new regulations are, uh, but what will they mean operationally uh, is, is still a question. Is, is it just more paperwork that needs to be done, uh, or will we see bigger changes um, in the project planning and realization phases? Um, Julia, I would like to direct this question to you first. Of course. Thank you. And, and actually, thanks a lot for the opportunity to, to participate to this conference. Um, yeah, what does it mean operationally for the sector? I think it's definitely not only paperwork. Uh, it's a change in mindset in, in management, meaning that um, when we... So, so Next Energy is an investment manager, and when we are about to acquire an asset to our funds, we have to do due diligence, exactly as Cardison was explaining. We were doing that even prior, uh, prior to uh, the taxonomy and the SFDR introduction, but what the SFDR and the taxonomy have introduced is a level playing field uh, to the extent that we are asking now all counterparties, the, the, the seller of the project, the EPC contractor or the ONM, we're asking 
or the investment manager asking the same question. So what it does is um, definitely not paperwork, is changing the mindset of those EPC and ONN, that they need to be able to provide us with information on how do they manage biodiversity, whether they are able to manage biodiversity on site, whether they can account for water consumption or waste management through the panel. So it's, it's kind of asking questions for them to realize, do we have in our process, processes, do we have the right, um, the right instrument and the right approach to account for impacts that are not only health and safety, traditionally reviewed by the industry, but it also encompasses uh, environmental and social impacts. So it includes also community, for example, engagement or um, community plan uh, related to, to, uh, to the asset. So that's definitely what I'm expecting as a change um, in the industry. And Tanya, is it also something that you experienced that your EPCs with with whom you cooperate and uh, from who you um, um, buy assets, um, can they deliver on these questions? Can they fulfill these requirements already? Do you see a trend? Yes, also from my side, good afternoon and thank you for having me. But yes, um, let me add maybe two little things. Um, as Carsten showed in his presentation, the EU Sustainable Finance Initiative is huge. Um, the Commission estimated that more than 180 billion additional investments a year are needed to achieve the EU climate targets. And the solar sector, they we will play a huge role in achieving uh, this goal. And in the old world, the world before all these regulations, our product was solar energy. But now uh, these regulations are asking for sustainable solar power, meaning um, solar power produced in line with environmental, social and governance criteria. Um, so I always say it's no longer enough to do the right thing. We need now to do the right thing right. And uh, so I compared it with uh, climbing Mount Everest. Uh, and I would say uh, yeah, it definitely feels like this at the moment, and we even haven't reached base camp yet. So huge things are in front of us, of, of us and of our partners. Um, maybe for clarity, Carsten, all these regulations are not mandatory. So it's all voluntary things the companies have to fulfill. So which, what do you think? Which project developers and investors will, will have to follow these regulations? And or is that, doesn't this question count at all? Because at the end, it will be just followed by all. It, it would be the first time that I hear that a regulation is voluntary. No, so what I, I, I meant <laughs> with this is that so it, it gives you voluntary targets. I mean, it means you can also do something. It's not forbidden to do something what is not sustainable. Well, according to this regulations, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So first of all, it was only a joke, don't worry. Um, but uh, it is all about disclosure. In general, what you need to do is you need to be transparent about it. And then the question is, do you actually want to say that you may have issues with human rights or um, there you you um, you you will you have some adverse impacts in your portfolio? So the question in the first thing is about transparency. And then what you can clearly see is. I mean, there is also a third uh, um, initiative uh, that is called the CSDR, and that is all about this non-financial reporting of companies. And there, the scope with the April proposal has also been massively um, enlarged. So it's just a question of time when this will arrive. And either you're going to be directly um, affected or maybe you're indirectly affected. Maybe you want to sell the solar plant later to an institutional investor or maybe you would come later in scope. So it is more um, a question of time when you will be in scope anyhow. And for me, it's clear I would consider this, uh, especially these criteria, um, uh, starting from the beginning, because uh, long term, for sure, it will have an impact. And the taxonomy is used for so many things. It's about green bonds. It's about um, green funds. Uh, you will have reporting requirements as part of a non-financial reporting. Um, so I would really get started and, and take them at least into account and try to fulfill them as as um, as good as possible. But at the beginning, it's only for, for at the beginning, it's only for those who are financed via the capital market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Exactly. Uh, it is um, in the beginning, primarily for the ones that are financed by the capital market, but also when you develop a project and you might want to sell it to an institutional investor, then um, you will see that Julia will maybe join you and it's clear which questions uh, she will ask. So uh, over and over, um, it's it's going to um, yeah, move over the entire market sooner or later. Mm. Exactly. Maybe Julia, can you can you also explain what this means for non EU origin entities? Uh, since Next Energy Capital is uh, no longer in the EU, uh, as it's located yeah. in the United Kingdom. Yeah. So, so well, first first of all, um, I think whether so as per the regulation, whether an entity is physically or the legal entity addresses in in Europe or non Europe, what matters really is where the financial product is marketed. So, so that's the first remit. Uh, in, in, to the extent of Next Energy, for example, all the funds, so the financial products, are marketed in Europe, and that's why Next Energy is affected. Um, I think when it comes to non-European fund or investment manager, well, first they will see whether they are captured at the by the letter by the regulation, uh, so whether they uh, market the they, they, their product in Europe. But I think also even if they are not captured. It, uh, the, the legislation is setting a trend. So it's, it's giving an example even for other uh, market participants that may not be captured today, but they will be interacted with investors that are looking for similar uh, compliance like the EU regulation. So I guess it's definitely starting in Europe or for investment manager and market participant that are uh, marketing their, their products with European investor. But it will have a, a like a ripple effect beyond Europe because, of course, it's it's a global industry, so um, it, it's not affecting Europe only. And I very much agree with Carsten that it does start with with who uh, works in capital market, but it, it will go beyond because it's really once you ask the question, you then ask the question to your EPC, the EPC asks the question to the supply chain, so it's becoming like a market standard, I would say, mm -hmm. and that's the impact that it will take time for all the market to react. I, I think I think we have a we have a, a question from the audience that would tap into that. Um, the, the question is, um, if I don't care uh, um, and, and I don't care about sustainability, won't there still be enough c capital for me to tap into and, and realize my projects and then they're not labeled sustainable. But but what's what's really the adverse effect on that for me as a project developer? And I, I, I put this quis question maybe to Tanya first. Yeah, but you know, yeah, what's happening when I'm not when I'm not doing what the market is asking? So I think the first thing we, we see is that we see a clear demand for the mark from the market for these kind of sustainable assets. You know? On the other hand, I think it's also proven that um, sustainable business models uh, naturally lead to more economical growth. Uh, and I think thirdly, um, companies not transitioning towards um, sustainability, um, they might have to deal also with reputational problems, which eventually might lead to uh, a decrease in value. Um, so I think not caring is not an option. Okay. Agreed. <laughs> Maybe I can jump in with yeah. another um, participants' questions because they are now coming in. Um, besides EPC and developers and M providers, who else will be impacted? Will suppliers across the value chain, so for example, module manufacturers outside the EU, will be held accountable for following, following those guidelines? Um, I don't know, if maybe we start with Carsten with, Carsten with this question. <laughs> Uh, maybe connecting these two questions because they're very interrelated. So uh, let me ask the following question. If you want to sell to an institutional investor, or if you want to finance via a bank and the bank asks this question and you can't answer it or you provide a negative answer, it's long term, simply you will have less demand. And in the end, you're driven by demand. Short term, it might not be a problem, but long term it is. And that's the same as Julia said, when you're outside of the EU or you're a producer, institutional investors, banks, but also companies, because in the future they need also to be transparent, they will ask this question uh, to you. And the danger that is about um, about solar is that solar is automatically, um, automatically legible. 
there is no threshold on the S SC uh, criteria. So that means uh, when you have something from solar that is not eligible, it automatically becomes clear you have an issue in the DNSH criteria. And that means you are um, making it transparent that you um, that you violate one of the either the minimum social safeguards or uh, some of the DNSH uh, principles. Short and um, I don't think long term this is a good idea. Short explanation for our witnesses: DNSH is do no do no significant harm. So we have mm -hmm. to show that you don't val um, um, oppose to other uh, targets, sustainability mm -hmm. targets. Marian, do we have time for another question, or do we have to move on? We have time for a last question. <laughs> <laughs> There's one question which is also uh, which uh, pe people also want to know. That is, um, we have already f at the moment is quite abstract. But are there more concrete examples of what that could mean? For example, I mean the concrete ex one concrete example in OMN is to let sheep graze. I mean, a lot of O&M service providers already do this, um, or also to to add some biotopes. Are there are there um, at the mo up to date at the moment, are there already other concrete examples what um, what you consider when you when you look at these issues? Um, maybe first Julia and then Tanya. Short answer because yeah. we have to move on. I, yeah, no, sh very short answer. Yeah, I, I think uh, it very much depends on the organization. Uh, a focus, for example, for the solar sector could be water because it is related to climate change, the scarcity of water and particularly solar asset are located in water scarcity areas. So one option, once you start measuring the impact on water, so the, the, the use of water, then you can set yourself a target. And it could be that you put your solar panel on top of agriculture, agricultural land, and you use water uh, con um, uh, together with, with agriculture. So you just optimize the use of water or you minimize the use of water by other technique. So it's important to measure because unless you, unless you measure, you cannot uh, manage, as you know. So that, that's, water is an example and same for biodiversity. Starting measuring will, will help us setting baseline and setting targets for improving. Tanya? Something to add? Yes, let me just add this. The second one is also the one which is big on our screen. It's the biodiversity. Uh, you know, we have a lot of, of land. We have a lot of uh, solar power plants and the need of them, you know, it, eco ecological um, things might go hand in hand with economical things, you know. So bio biodiversity is one of those topics which we are... Um, really um, working on and in, in making that, that topic work. All right. Thank you all for being here today and sharing your insights on this new topic. And I'm, I'm really sure that this debate will continue uh, definitely here at PV Magazine as we continue our reporting on it. Uh, but maybe already later, after the session, uh, uh, there's a meet a speaker networking opportunity and maybe uh, our audience can meet uh, some of you there. Uh, thanks again for joining this debate today. Thank you. Moving on, bifacial modules had experienced quite a hype when they first appeared on the market. Everybody was very excited for that extra bit of oomph from the coming from the back, uh, but how much of it had never been really an easy answer. Suddenly, diffuse light fractions and ground albedo became important specs to consider, and that made accurate yield predictions quite a tall order. Flying in the face of tricky yield predictions, Jinko Solar had realized a significant bifacial project here in Europe, and all without subsidies. How, you might ask? Well, for this, I can welcome my next guest, Roberto Mogioni. He is the head of technical service and product management at Jinko Solar, and he's going to tell us what Jinko has done during commissioning to enable this project. Hi, Roberto. Hello. Hi, Marian. How are you doing? <laughs> good, good, excellent. Roberto, yeah. what have you done? Uh, well, well, I mean, uh, that's uh, an, an important topic because, I mean, the bifacial trend is very, very impressive, actually, uh, much more than we expected. So let, let me start by sharing uh, the screen and showing the presentation. Okay, so... Well, I mean, today we will speak about uh, the, the real, a concrete bifacial project, which is 200 megawatt peak in Greece. 
Um, but w w let me please start with a very short introduction about the trend, what is happening in the market. I mean, uh, according to the last um, numbers we, we have analyzed, we see that in 2021-2022, we will reach 30% of installations of bi bifacial cells, which is actually um, not that correct because, I mean, uh, we see the trend is actually boosting. It's, uh, it's increasing rapidly. And even next year, our production plan is to have 60% of the, the products in bifacial configuration, which is impressive. So regarding projects, we, I think, we, I mean, having a bifacial in our portfolio and being, uh, let me say, a very innovative uh, technology since 2018, when we went on mass production, the, the, the main topic was, uh, yes, but how about your background, how we can, assure that this reliability or the energy yield about these um, performance products. Uh, well, then we, of course, we realize different, I mean, project to different track um, records. And uh, I have to say that the, the final results are, are very, very positive. And uh, because, I mean, just to remind everyone how it, it works, it, it mainly, I mean, the, the, the real side of the funnel will actually be active and will, will produce, it will produce between 5% and realistically 15% energy more in a, uh, in a different scenarios. And what is actually, um, I mean, uh, very important, as you said, is actually the albedo. And uh, this is the most critical part right now. Point one, PV, um, uh, simulators are not really accurate. Uh, they are, um, to be very honest, very conservative, which is also a good point on the other hand. And uh, taking realistic and long-term measurements of the albedo, it's taking too much time, so we have to find another solution. Um, other than that, we have to face the possibility of having two different technologies in the market. One is uh, dual glass and the other one is transparent backsheet. Both of them, they have positive and negative sides. We strongly suggest for very standard solution the um, transparent backsheet because, I mean, it will strongly reduce the LCOE and it will be very comfortable to install because we don't increase the weight. So, but now going to the core of this presentation and uh, let, let's speak uh, how we achieve the financing and the, the approval of this, um, actually, which is the biggest bifacial project in Europe located in Kozani in Greece. Well, I mean, let, let me say that first, uh, what, what was the main condition? Because, I mean, of course, investors, they analyzed monofacial um, uh, financing opportunity and bifacial. And the main condition was mini minimum, offering minimum 5% energy more for from bifacial compared to monofacial. So this was, for the financing point of view, the, 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 the base, the, the, the key point. And the investor, what asked to us, basically, being a really new product and not having a, a strong track record, a long track record, they asked, of course, the data background, what we had at, the, at that very moment. They asked at least two, 200 uh, flash test records to see, um, including uh, the real side of every module. They also asked for specific test protocol in order to check the reliability of the transparent back sheet and of the bifacial product itself. And also they have to get a technical solution in order to constantly keep monitoring the different production between bifacial and monofacial to check effectively the energy more that bifacial can produce. And this is actually what we offered as an initial phase, but I mean, the, the very innovative uh, solution we, we offered here to the final customer was actually the, um, the insurance, the energy yield insurance. What does it mean? Well, uh, in principle, we assigned uh, the energy yield assessment to an external company, which was from offer at that time in order to 
um, to check a, a real, uh, let me say, simulation and real data from uh, from an external party to understand how much energy we can provide more. After we received the final report, we were able to ensure by using an external insurance, so to guarantee and so to reinforce the banks, the investors, our uh, reliability, our capability. So we ensured we make guarantees, external guarantees by using an insurance that this uh, project with this condition can provide 5% energy more. And this is quite, let me say, um, rare in the market because we speak only about power usually, but this time we spoke about energy. And, and this is something that, I mean, it's, it's, it's very important to highlight in order to overcome the, the very first challenges that, I mean, uh, by facial products uh, we had to face, let me say. Um, and yes, and, and, that, and that's mainly the, the, the core of this, I mean, how to, and how to explain how we overcome all the main uh, difficulties at this very moment. Thank you very much, Roberto. I'm sure our viewers have quite a few questions with regards to this project. Um, and Michael, you're here. What does our online community say? Yes, indeed, there are questions coming in. The first one is a bit more abstract, so it's about uh, it's a if-when question. So, uh, what is the percentage of addition additional production for the backside if the structure is not designed for bifacial models? So, does that make sense? So, to use regular structure, and what can I expect then? Yeah, uh, I, ca I can uh, easily um, reply to this question because we made at our laboratory specific tests. Because I mean, the main questions back in two years ago was, should I spend money and adapt my structure, my design in order to optimize the energy uh, coming from the real side of the, the models? Well, I have to say that the answer, the final answer is no. I mean, um, by using a standard structure, you can just slightly optimize it. And in any case, the profiles on the back are not going to interfere in a very important percentage that makes sense to make, uh, to let me say, to change it. So that's that's the main point. So uh, the, the bifacial technology can be adapted in a very standard structure and still, yes, you will lose a percentage, but it's very, uh, how to say, very small part. So finally, uh, the answer is no. Mm. Another question, how much, how accurate can you guarantee the performance of a bifacial plant? So um, how good does that work? <laughs> that, that's, that's, uh, um, that's a critical part because um, the, the accuracy is now the, um, the missing part in bifacial. Why? Because the algorithm of the main um, softwares right now in the market are not really precise. On the other hand, by using external parties, let me say, and uh, using their expertise, and uh, we can increase this accuracy right right now. But still, uh, there is a let me say uh, a long job uh, to to do in this way. Mm -hmm. I, I maybe also have another question from the audience here, and, and they're asking for a risk of mismatch between the cells uh, on the rear side of your module and, and how that's actually affecting um, the, the power production of that module. The, the mismatch of the back side, of the rear side, um, is not important as in the front side. So the, the real effect is um, is of is of course an effect that we have to take into consideration, but in any case, I mean it, it's not even it's not comparable to the front side. So we we have of course to check the mismatch even when we are going to design. We again, I suggest always to to improve slightly the design, but to not make dramatically changes in this case. Maybe another question uh, uh, for on that on that uh, project and and to see how you managed to get that performance guarantee. Um, did you have to make on-site visits to to go and check with um, all sorts of albedo and iridians measurement um, uh, meters to to see 
uh, and calculate sure. what the what the yield could be? Sure, sure, sure. I mean, uh, first of all, we, we um, this was quite a complex uh, project because uh, it involves not only standard structure but also trackers. So involving trackers, the, compl the complexity of the project will increase, of course. Uh, yes, we, we went on site, a customer as well. We did our internal measurements, but to have a final assessment, we assigned an external parties to, uh, to run albedo measurements and uh, energy yield assessments in order to also compare and check our internal measurements, our internal simulations, and um with the, the external parties so uh, let me structure in this way jinko made a, a preliminary let me say uh, on-site measurements uh, in a prayer in, a, in, a, in the, when the, the project was starting and then when it was in a, a concrete phase we moved to the ex external third-party laboratory to to have an external report and one other question in this direction is what the injury of this performance uh, guarantee, um, what proof or documentation did it want? Then, uh, well, I mean, the external um, insurance, first of all, it's, it's uh, in external insurance, which is very um, used, let me say, it's very um, uh, well known in the market. They are very uh, uh, the expertise of this insurance is uh, it's on top, and uh, they let, let me say they just um, made a site visit in our, our factories. They checked our uh, panel production. They checked also the all the protocol of the um, tests that we um, agreed with all the parties. And only after that, and after the report from the external parties, they were able to elaborate and make an offer in order to guarantee the extra energy yield of that specific project. So it's, it's not a generic offer, but it's a specific offer for that specific project. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto, for joining us here today and sharing your expertise with us and uh, the audience. I hope you can stick around for a bit longer and continue discussing with our audience during the Meet the Speaker session. I can see here that there were multiple questions left open, but unfortunately, we don't have time and we got to move on. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up next, we will continue discussing commissioning and pro commissioning processes, and uh, this time we will talk about a component uh, that comes very often in combination with bifacial modules. I'm talking about single-axis trackers, of course. In the past, there were numerous reports of trackers experiencing damages during high wind events. Uh, the result were colossal financial and reputational damages. Yes, and the industry reacted on this. Vendors, wind tunnel experts and structural engineers sat down together and they revised the design of single axis trackers. And we want to know now, is this crisis over? Will it, does it mean that this topic is really handled well? Coming up next, I'm happy to welcome onto the stage Alex Rödel. He's Senior Director of Design and Engineering at Next Tracker. And joining Alex are Markus Balz, Managing Director at SBP Sonne, and Gerhard Weinrebe, Director at SBP Sonne. This is a company which is an independent, independent engineering office. Thank you all for joining here today. And uh, let's begin with the first question. We have uh, seen many trackers uh, fail in the past, as, as we just said, and we've also seen the reaction from the industry. Uh, a lot of work has been put into the design um, so is it really just a matter of uh, buying uh, the tracker with a revised design and then I don't have to worry anymore? Uh, Gerhard, maybe I put this question first on you. Okay, so thanks for having us and letting me start. Um, to answer the question, unfortunately, it's not as simple as that because for cost reasons, trackers are always tailored to the specific site. This means, for example, that the torque tube wall sickness is adapted to the expected wind loads. And the wind loads, of course, in turn, depend on local wind climate, on the topography, and the specific plant layout. And thus, uh, trackers that may look identical, in reality, they are different. For example, they differ um, depending on if they are located at the perimeter of the plant, or at the center, or at the edge, or at the road, or wherever. 
And even the module type has an impact. So the module mass determines the tracker's eigenfrequency and thus its aeroelastic behavior. And therefore, to put it in a nutshell, this means there is still a lot that can go wrong, even with a well-designed tracker. And thus double checking assumptions and the calculations for the specific site and for the plant layout, this is still both are still a must. And Marcus, so, maybe the question maybe you can go on. What do you do to adapt the tracker then to the different wind scenarios which you find? So you, you go there, measure, and then how do you how do you go forward? And I, you haven't mentioned it. I think soil conditions are also an important point where you have to adapt. How do you go on with this? Thanks a lot for the question. Um, obviously, I mean, the. the the environmental loading conditions for trackers is the main design criteria and that drives the cost and the safety of a tracker technology. So therefore, quite a lot of efforts have to be done in the environmental loading conditions, um, mainly the um, wind speeds, because these are the parts where um, the cost is driven the most or the failure is also determined. So um, it goes down from um, long-term um, statistical wind measurements that are being assessed and evaluated um, the directionality of the site and where the extreme winds are coming from are an important issue. Um, and we also clarify even by a site visits um, the exposure categories, how is the surrounding of the plant. Um, and because those plants are massive and large and the cost is massive, even things that are usually not done or allowed in the codes like um, air density corrections for altitudes and temperatures um, may come into play. Um, and also the discussion of return periods of how the statistical evaluation are necessary. And then again, because we are talking about the tracker, so it has different CP factors in different operation modes. Um, the wind speeds for the operations and the extreme wind speeds needs to be discussed. Also, that is not what is usually um, done at standard buildings. Anymore. So, so you, you know, just even though the, some complex words were used, it's quite a complex task to do. Um, however, it needs to be done because um, the safety and the cost and the cost effectiveness of a technology is fully defined by the wind speeds. Obviously, getting to the soil conditions and um, those are always an impact on the cost as well and the safety criteria. However, that and also the corrosion categories of those sites are usually um, better understood and um, are state of the art and the design principles do not vary that much um, if you compare it to the wind speeds, for example. Okay, uh, let's get Alex involved here. And uh, Alex, what, what can tracker manufacturers really do to support engineering companies uh, like SPP in their work? Yeah, I think what we always say is all that upfront engineering is really going to pay off in the long run. And let, let's talk about why some things um, we think they're okay yesterday, but they're not okay today. So the first thing that you see is solar is being put into more high risk regions than ever before. We see in Europe, solar going into UK. We, we, we see them being put next to wind turbines in, in Denmark. Uh, Turkey is becoming more popular. And we just saw a presentation, which was news to me, that the biggest bifacial project in, in Europe is in Greece. Uh, now that, in the fact, is amazing. But as we push into these new regions, more risks are going to happen. Um, and that includes risks from, from wind, but that also includes risks from project developers. Um, a lot of times we're left with, left with very limited information at the time. And what you don't want to do is you know, all of a sudden, two or three years down the line, you, were, you realize that flooding is at your site. You realize you have soil conditions that you didn't expect. That is not how to protect your long-term assets. So when owners can combine with, with great firms like SPP, you can really much protect yourself in, in the long run. What we have also seen in the recent, in the last year, basically, um, with a quite rapid high speed, the market is adapting to the uh, getting it to, to the larger models which you are seeing on the market. Um, all these calculations which have been done for tracker safety, do they still count, or is it back to the drawing board and you have to start again, Alex? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think overall the industry has improved greatly, right? 
we looked before that trackers we originally thought was like a roof. So we kept them flat and horizontal. Then we moved on and then we figure out uh, that there's dynamic modes happening with them, right? But along with new regions, they're also being challenged like never before with large format modules, okay? So a lot of folks have seen that first level of destruction, unfortunately, uh, that first mode, that torsional mode, that twist it like that. But now as these large format modules takes over this whole solar industry, we're seeing other modes. We're seeing aspects like uh, a heaving mode, which is a bouncing up and down, or there's a snaking mode uh, that, that moves back and forth. And all these things are going to be challenged. And what folks need to realize is that not all wind tunnel tests are created equal. We see some second tier suppliers going to, to universities, you know, but realistically, those major wind tunnel testing firms like IFI in, in, in Europe or CPP in the US or, or RWDI in, um, in Canada, they have so much experience in, in our once thought simplistic structures are anything but. They're extremely complex. So as we as we go out and we expand into to, to Greece and, and Turkey and, and we go into 2022, 2023, and we put on these large format modules, we're going to see challenges today that we never faced before. Okay, uh, we've talked a lot about the problems uh, uh, that that exist in the in the market and a lot of the challenges. Um, but maybe Markus and Gerhard, uh, you can uh, tell us uh, what investors and project developers can really do to be on the safe side that that their assets will uh, be, will be built for eternity, or maybe not for eternity, but for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Um I mean, designing for the future and and so on, usually people scream about um, that we want to have codes and design codes and safety and so on. However, the tracker market is, let's say, pretty new, but enormous. But to fix anything in the code yet where technologies are still being changed um, and module phases change and um, configurations change, it would be too early to actually have a code. Um, the first step would be obviously to think a little bit more of their own specifications, what do they want to have? So writing an RFQ, which defines their um, safety criteria and defines a little bit more than just that they call up a code of the building code and maybe a wind speed would be already a good start. We are in the process of several um, large um, de developers of actually doing that um, because there's currently no defined um, codes to do all of that correctly. and the industry is still not immature is the wrong word, but um, there are still loads of things changing. So therefore, um, safety criteria have to be described. On the other hand, if you do it over safe, it becomes incompetitive for um, the developer to build the plant. So um, spending the attention upfront correctly to define all of those boundary conditions is essential in this case. Mm -hmm. And how can investors and project de developers be motivated to follow such guide guidelines? I think the motivation honestly happens with the financial incentive. Um, unfortunately, a lot of owners and asset managers have been reactionary. Okay, um, And one of the biggest things, of course, is around the largest asset associated with, with solar is the module itself. And, and folks need to realize that China has the most manufacturers, of course, but they're also the biggest consumers. So that means that the specifications like IEC 61215 or the dynamic specification IEC 62782 is going to be made for fixed tilt systems. So how do we get there, right? First of which, which is great, is discussions on panels like these. You know, the more people understand what's going on, uh, the better they can be associated with it. The second is actually bringing great independent engineers, SBP being one of them. There's, there's several because some of the reviews happening right here uh, during the, the initial RFQ stage aren't enough. And what that's going to mean is for your asset, that's going to mean you might have unstable trackers, which will lead to micro cracking, right? Just because you don't have a disaster doesn't mean the, 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 the module isn't performing what it's up to. Um, so people really need to focus upfront rather than be reactionary. Alex, but then a question right here. Oh. Maybe I heard somebody wanted to answer in that. No, Alex, but then uh, I will ask you from a reputational risk perspective, we heard at the beginning uh, and, and we're all very aware 
um, uh, of the reputation trackers, single access trackers have um, mm -hmm. or have had in the past. Um, why, why would vendors still sell uh, their products to developers that are not rigorously following uh, rules and, and set RFQs, uh, as we just discussed? I mean, the, the damage in the end is, is on the vendors of the, of the trackers and not necessarily uh, on those who reviewed the, the of course. Yeah, there's, this, is, this is the big question, right? Because solar in itself, we're at the race to the bottom. Every single, uh, you know, PPA that's coming out these days, you know, you hear stuff from the Middle East, like the lowest cost per watt in history. And, and, and that stuff is incredible for the market, but it also puts a lot of stress on the module manufacturers, the, the, the tracker vendors, um, everyone associated with, with supplying to, to that site. OK, and because that race to the bottom is counteracting with longevity and reliability, we have this 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 great conflict going on. Um, and that's something that the industry is, is really trying to solve uh, every single day. And it becomes harder and harder to harder. So people just need to, to focus that says, hey, you know what? Maybe the lowest upfront cost isn't isn't the best long term cost the LCOE at the end of 30 years, the design life, right? Because no matter what you do, if you're a module manufacturer, if you're a tracker vendor, you're, you're an IE, right? Everyone in solar is in the business of making power, okay? And what do we need to make power? Forget about re redesigning a tracker. We want uptime, right? We want everything operating as it should be. Uh, and the more we have panels like this, the more we have regulations, the more we have better IEs, the better we are going to be off as an industry. Maybe a short last question. Um, I mean, you say it seems that the market signals um, more this cost pressure, uh, this capex cost mm -hmm. pressure, and motivates to build cheaper at cost of longevity. Isn't that an obvious situation and with an obvious solution, which would be to introduce um, engineered code-based standards? Maybe Marcus and or Gerhard, maybe yeah. one of you would like to answer. Yeah, I tried to explain it a little bit earlier, but um, the code is always good if you have a definition of what is correct and what is wrong. At the moment, also a code, if you would implement that at the moment, it would actually stop innovation. So because suddenly new approaches cannot be in accordance to the code and then the cost driven and the performance increase that we currently see on those technologies would be more or less killed. So I think a design guidelines or something like that would be the right time to be introduced or to be established um, or proper specifications and the developers and owners actually writing proper specification, maybe with our help, is also a good start. Um, but a code from today onwards, I would not say that this is the right way to go as of yet. Let's, let's talk this question again in another two years. I'll throw in another question, uh, very short, and, and please a short answer to that, uh, from the audience. Um, and the question was whether um, there is, it, it's possible to give an advice to just use small modules, so not the big modules. And Alex, you touched up it, uh, on it earlier that you mm -hmm. said there's new modes um, uh, as to yeah. compared to what we've seen before. Um, but maybe, Marcus, you can also uh, uh, give an advice yeah. or get yeah. Can it? Can I start, Alex? Um, I would say um, large is beautiful. Um, and usually um, the cost drivers um, tend to that um, costs are actually going down um, the larger the systems become. Um, from our solar experience, we did that on many things that we made things just larger and larger and larger because we build large plants as well. And therefore, large is usually the better solution. There are hiccups with additional or lower eigenfrequencies with larger modules in the design. However, after they have been sorted out, um, larger modules will lead to a more competitive um, solar plant. Yeah, I agree. And, and I love the, the term large is beautiful um, because just because the, the tracker is getting a bit more expensive doesn't mean it, it's not a better system as a whole. So all of us are part of the individual ecosystems that we've been talking about. It's better for the whole project for solar to get out there to have larger modules. So you might have some risks, but you also have reward. All right. Thank you very much. Vendor choice is important, as we heard, but it isn't everything. Site-specific engineering and design best practices are equally important. And I think we can conclude that the responsibility to ensure that safety of such installations lies 
with the vendors, uh, but also with the EPCs, the investors, and the independent engineers. Uh, a big thank you uh, to you, Alex of Net Next Tracker, and, and Markus and Gerhard from the independent engineer, SBP Zonner. Thank you so much for your time today and uh, enriching our debate here. I hope some of you can stick around for the Meet the Speaker uh, later on. Our Our next topic concerns another old foe of the solar industry. Multiple gigawatts of solar modules have been affected already, and there are many more modules that we already know of that they will exit their service life prematurely. Cracking and choking are the worst enemies of asset owners, for that they mean expensive repairs, prolonged downtime, low system availability, and quite often lengthy legal battles over warranty claims. PI Berlin has seen many such cases, and they offer as a service advice to their customers how to handle such issues. Steven Shirep is the Director of Sales of and Project, Developer, <coughs> Project Delivery. With years of experience with arrays showing such defects, he has brought with him today two cases uh, showing how the problem can be tackled at different stages of a life cycle of a plant. Hi, Steven. Hello, Marian. Thanks for having me. And, as you can see, Stephen isn't alone in the segment today, but we are happy to welcome Lucy Garouille, Technical Manager for the EMEA region at DuPont Photovoltaic Solutions. Hi, Lucy. Hi. Hi, Maria. Um, and DuPont have brought to the market a new solution to backsheet failures that we will be discussing in a few minutes here on stage. Uh, and also, we will be answering your questions again at the end of this backsheet segment, so make sure to submit yours. Um, but for now, Stephen, we will uh, let you go first and introduce us to the first case study. Great, thanks so much, Marian. Yeah, today, I think uh, many of us and, and m many people attending this, this conference today have heard presentations about backsheets uh, issues over the years. And here I just wanted to present two case studies uh, that we can use for, for, for further discussion. Uh, PI Berlin is often brought in as a, a technical advisor by the asset owner. Um, they determine that there's some level of chalking or cracking on the backsheets and want to know what are the risks, what can they do. Um, so the, in this first case study, um, it was a 10 megawatt plant in Spain. The module warranty, the product warranty was still valid. So there were still a few years. So it was a 10 year warranty. There were about three years, if I remember, left in, in the product warranty. Um, and the, the asset owner had already um, done a visual inspection on the whole plant to determine that 100% of their modules had been affected by chalking. Uh, and confirmed that they were all of the same material. Um, and of that 100% with chalking, 1% uh, already had cracks. Um, so they had approached the, the module supplier, uh, put in a, a claim regarding uh, the backsheet chalking and cracks. Um, and as I think many of us know, uh, chalking itself won't be accepted under uh, most module warranties. Uh, it's seen as, uh, you know, an aesthetic uh, issue uh, and, uh, and also the science has also shown that not all chalking necessarily leads to cracks, uh, into insulation issues. So it's only really accepted as a, a claimable defect when there are cracks. So now it was, what do we do with this, you know, roughly thousand modules on site? And the supplier came with an offer to repair those thousand modules on site. Uh, they presented their methodology, and we were asked by, by the owner to have a look at it and see if they should accept it. Um, and I put there in the, in the bottom corner four things to, to ask for. One is how is the repair going to be done? And not how it's going to be done in the factory or in the laboratory, rather how is it going to be done on site where there's you know, potentially rain, sun, wind, et cetera, how to make sure that the conditions are going to be the same as, as how the procedure was done by the supplier. How often has the, the module supplier already done this repair method? Have they done any kind of extended durability tests on, on, this, uh, on the back sheets that have been repaired? And what is the process to, to do the acceptance of the repair on site? And since those uh, questions were not sufficiently answered, we and the owner um, you know, tried to push for replacement. Uh, in the end, there was a commercial agreement that the, the cost of the module, since the module supplier no longer produced those modules, 
uh, a price for replacement modules was agreed upon and also uh, a, a price, a fixed price per module for the labor, labor cost. So then it was up to the asset manager to, to move ahead, um, follow out QA on the modules that they, they selected that could fit into their system and continue to do annual visual inspection on the rest of the modules going forwards in order to, to have claimable modules before the end of the product warranty. All right, Lucy, welcome back. Uh, you just heard what Stephen described here. Is that consistent with uh, the challenges uh, um, and, and, uh, that you have seen out in the field and uh, in your work? when we get into detail but uh, this is a, a very typical case um, that you see so some of the panels are damaged through chalking in this case as Stephen said it's it's not a claimable defect however it is very characteristic of a polyamide case so we know that polyamide will only move one way eventually the whole of the park will be cracked it just starts at different times so the, the complicated thing here is that you may replace only 1% of the park. Of, of course, you can't put old modules with new modules because you need to keep your, your current the same through your string. So in this case, you need to deinstall uh, the defective panel plus another old non-defective panel so that you can consolidate your old panels all together and then consolidate all your new panels together and with an added cost potentially of um, applying a different format. Um, so these cases are complicated because it will increase the cost to the asset manager. And of course, there is a cost also to the module maker. So all of these cases need to be taken one by one to see what makes most sense between repair and replace. And we will continue to discuss this and also um, how to bring the warranty claims and um, uh, what, what some of the problems with structured warranty claims are. Uh, but Stephen, uh, you brought a second case with you that was a little bit different. Uh, uh, let's hear a little bit more about that. Right, thanks. Yeah, so in the, in the second case, uh, a slightly larger uh, project in, in Italy. And uh, in this case, there was no longer the product warranty from the module supplier. This had uh, expired already. Um, however, the, the asset owner had a, a, a little bit more luck, let's say, that only a quarter of the modules were affected by chalking. Um, and they, they had already done this through, through their own O&M teams, doing a visual inspection on site. And this tw the 25% of the modules that had chalking all were uniform in terms of the, the type of, of backsheet material that was also used. And in this case, there was no cracks. So the asset owner came to us and said, okay, what's, you know, we, we, we realize that there's, there's nothing happening at the moment in terms of, you know, inverter failures uh, or faults, not failures, but inverter faults. Um, there, there's no safety issue uh, at the moment. However, as conscientious uh, asset managers, they want to understand what risks are, are uh, coming to them uh, in the future and how they can assess it and mitigate them. So um, when they contracted PI Berlin, we were asked to, to have a look at these 25% of the modules and look at the varying degrees of, of chalking that, that were there. And this you know, varying level could be you know, environmental effects uh, on such a large area uh, that one is exposed per perhaps to, to higher temperatures or more moisture. So there were different levels of chalking. And what we decided to do was take uh, various samples and have these tested at our laboratory and at the, the laboratory of uh, Peter Lechner at uh, ZSW uh, to conduct these elongation at break lab tests and that where you're actually testing the tensile strength in two different directions of the, of the polymer. And with that, you can classify the risk um, that uh, Dr. Lechner has presented previously at, at PVSEX. Uh, in the past, and based on the results of those tensile strength measurements, you can put them into low, medium, or high risk classes of how likely cracks are going to develop. And, and this is very useful for, for an asset manager because they can then say, okay, uh, luckily in this case, none of them were in the high risk case, meaning that 
Um, you know, there was nothing that was going to crack uh, in the very short term future. And they had, you know, 20% of the modules that were in a low risk class, meaning that they were very unlikely to, to, to crack in the future. Now, these tests are at a certain point in time, uh, but based on experience, uh, if, if they are in this class, they're un unlikely to, to crack in the future. And so 72% were in that medium class, which meant that, well, there's you know, uh, a medium risk of, of uh, cracking taking place. And with that information, then the asset owner can decide how much money they want to put aside for, it could be repair methods, as, as Lucy will be presenting, or for replacement modules uh, in the future that, uh, and, and to make sure that they are financially ready uh, in that case. Um, and part of our recommendation is to continue to do these, these uh, elongation of break tests going forward, perhaps every two years on the, on the same modules to monitor how they continue um, to progress, pr progress in the future and if any kind of adjustments need to be made to the module reserve account. Right. Well, Lucy, do you share this assessment? I mean, this is a pretty elaborate testing strategy Stephen just uh, suggested, so all the risk has been eliminated, right? So I, I wouldn't say all the risk has been eliminated. Uh, th there's a risk of doing nothing. There's a risk of doing something also, potentially. So uh, so it's, it's a case-by-case -case scenario. Uh, what we find is that, uh, strongly, is that um, the materials that have been chosen for the back sheet selection uh, will generally uh, give us some prediction on how they will behave in the field because um, they have behaved in a particular way in the field for a number of years. So if we take the example of polyamide, for example, I wouldn't do this kind of uh, risk classification on polyamide. We know it will crack, okay? Uh, but most certainly the test, the elongation tests that were performed in this case would also point that out. So they would probably put the, the polyamide material uh, on its own in a high risk category. Here, without seeing what material that was chosen for those panels, I can't really comment. So, so you're trying to potentially fix something that is not yet broken. In some cases, if you know for sure you will get there, well, pick your moment and repair it. Okay, that that would be the the general message. If you know it will get there, pick your moment and repair it. All right. Okay. Well, before we're diving too deep into this topic already, I want uh, to give you Lucy the chance uh, to show another way to address this issue, uh, one that Stephen hasn't pointed out yet here. Thank you. So. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So what Stephen was mentioning is actually part of a bigger problem. So here uh, we've uh, performed assessment on about three gigawatts of, of panels installed in the field. What we found uh, was that about 16% of all panels showed some kind of back sheet degradation. Uh, but two-thirds of the back sheet problems we've seen in the field were about cracking, basically. And cracking does open uh, rights for claim. So um, potentially 10% of all the panels that we inspected in the field would need to see uh, the problem solved, either through replacement or through a repair strategy. If you go to the next slide... So we explain here that we, we have devised uh, a repair strategy um, in uh, two, uh, linking two components together. So one is uh, the material selection. So we've chosen materials that have been proven to work in the field without cracking for 30 years. Um, this material selection is not enough, however, to guarantee a good uh, final product in the, in the repair area. So as Stephen mentioned, uh, the repair needs to be done in a very controlled way. So uh, we partnered with another company called SC Refit and uh, they designed a process equipment to ensure that the repair is done the same but is done in the field to try and limit cost and also to try and limit uh, damage due to transport. So in this case, the equipment is allowing us to control the process very tightly. 
the objective of this repair strategy is not actually to just go to the end of the material and workmanship warranty. It's actually to go at least to the expected lifetime and beyond. And if you go to the next slide, I show you a case study there. Um, unfortunately, um, this is not about repair. This, this was very much like uh, in the first case that Stephen presented, it was a, a, a replace strategy. Um, so we had uh, polyamide on site and um, from the early part of 2018, uh, there were some cracked bag sheets in this case. The asset owner was actually archiving um, the insulation resistance values measured at the inverter level, the RISO value. And uh, the RISO value is, is very, um, it's fluctuating with a level of uh, humidity and current production. So it is a very viable um, output from many inputs. But you can see here that over the years, the RISO has decreased and decreased and decreased. So we're on a downward trend in terms of the electrical insulation on the back of the panel. So early in 2018, they had some water ingress on about 4% of the panels. So they replaced due to 4% of the part. That does mean that, as, as I mentioned before, when you have to replace panels with new panels, you very rarely have the same current category. So that means that you need to um, remove your defective panels from the strings and then replace them with your old panels with the same current rating as the other ones in the string. And then you can install your new panels consolidated together into a new string. And they did that about every six months for two years until finally um, they reached an agreement with the module manufacturer to actually replace all of the panels that had polyamide on the back. If you go to, to the next slide, I will explain a little bit the process here of replace and repair. So in the case where you want to replace uh, your panels, very often, um, the panels that we will be replaced will not be on the basis of a serial defect. We can talk about that some more. They will be on the basis of the defect noticed on the panel. So that means in this case, for both Stephen case and mine, um, they, the, the panel manufacturer accepted to replace only the panels with cracked back sheets, even though all the panels had the same materials and they were all going to produce the same output in the end. So you go through one iteration of having to replace some of your panels. So that implies deinstalling a defective panel, deinstalling a non-defective panel for old strain consolidation, and then you can reinstall um, non-defective panels onto your your uh, you can reinstall your your defective panels onto your your old strings. In the meantime, you might have to do some substructure changes for the new strings with the new panels. And then you can install your new panels together, rewire, reconnect. In the case of a repair, you will go through a little bit of the same process. So you deinstall all of your panels. You set aside some of them which are not actually repairable, maybe because there's damage due to cell breakage. So those are set aside. And then you perform your, your repair and you reinstall your, your repaired panels. The uh, set aside panels will be obviously replaced with uh, new panels and then you can rewire, reconnect. The difference here is that with the repair strategy, you only have one iteration. With the replace strategy, because of the, the way the warranty terms are set up, you will go through multiple iteration. In my case, four iteration in total before a total replacement was agreed with the module maker. Can go to the next slide. So I, I we summarize a little bit here. Um, the objective of a repair strategy should not be to just go to the end of the workmanship warranty, uh, to the material and workmanship warranty, which sometimes has been the case. 
our objective with this repair strategy is to go at least to the expected lifetime of a PV plant, that is 20, 25 years and beyond, because if the, the panels are generally not damaged by a cracked back sheet unless there's water ingress. So you could envisage to go even beyond the expected lifetime with a good repair strategy. It can be an attractive option to mitigate the risk and the financial liabilities. So as I showed, going through multiple iteration, you go through multiple downtime, you go through, through multiple uh, rewiring of parts of your park. It's a never ending process. So in this case, uh, the cost of repair should be below the cost of replacement. And it is very largely below when you consider the whole process of um, having to consolidate and having to, uh, to, to redesign a little bit your substructure and having to rewire. The repair should be on site to, um, to uh, reduce the cost as well. But if you're on site, you need to have a much uh, a very robust and consistent process. Okay, and then you do a technical audit uh, upfront because some panels can't be repaired. Some panels have other problems and it doesn't make sense to repair them. So a panel that has broken cells with hot spots, it makes no sense to repair such a, plan, uh, a panel. So your technical audit is, is paramount to the success of your repair strategy. And the repair should be performed only by qualified and trained personnel um, so you do have an equipment, but that doesn't mean you can just about do anything with your panel. You should treat it as a PV panel, not as a brick. So um, the, the addressable market, and, and that's where I think we have to push to have repair strategies in place rather than just replace every panel, is that we estimate that uh, on a yearly basis, we'll have to... Um, to address this problem on five to six gigawatts every year. Now, in the grand scheme of things, if, if you consider that we had 700 gigawatts of, of uh, installed capacity worldwide in 2020, five to six is nearly 1% of that installed capacity, but every year. So it will increase, this problem will increase. If we want a sustainable industry, somehow we'll have to uh, consider the whole cost, uh, not only in financial terms, but also in terms of sustainability of, of replacing of those panels. Okay, so we need to, to really consider repairing the panels. Okay, so I don't kit. know if you have other questions, Marianne. <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> a repair kit for back sheets. Um, let's bring Stephen also back into the studio and um, let's begin our question round. Um, Michael, I think uh, you start here on this one. Yes, Stephen. I mean, Lucy has shown quite impressively to us why she is in favor of a repair solution, not for a replacement solution. Um, let you ask you in this direction, um, what would a repair solution has to fulfill? Which condition it would have to meet that you would be convinced that one can go for repairing? So you're asking me that, so... No, no, so I'm asking Stephen this, oh, because good. you are convinced of <laughs> the repair solution. I haven't solution. convinced you yet. So <laughs> I'm asking Stephen, what, what do you think should a repair solution fulfill? What should it bring that, it, that you would accept it and you would be convinced? Uh, be it um, from the asset owner outside the warranty or within the warranty being presented by the supplier, um, you have to check those four points I mentioned uh, in, in my first case study. So we need to find out what is the procedure for that repair, where is it going to be done, how often has the, the, the supplier uh, of the service done this before, um, and how are we going to control the conditions on site? Because clearly the on site solution is the best for everyone, also, as Lucy had mentioned. The other thing is the, the, the reliability tests. You know, if, if these repair solutions, if the asset owner is going to take money in their own pocket, out of their own pocket, because they're outside of the warranty now, and they're going to start doing these repairs, then they also want to know 
um, that this solution is going to work in the long term. So the same type of uh, durability tests we want to do on new modules for the back sheets, we want to also do on these repaired modules to prove that they're actually going to last this long. Um, so that's that's basically how I would uh, recommend for for our uh, for our uh, customers who who are asset owners in this situation. And uh, and look, if the supplier says we want to test it out, um, you know, and they're still under warranty, and they're maybe providing additional warranty for this repair solution, then you know, by all means, go ahead and test it and see how it goes for the first uh, few years on a, on a sample of modules on site. And these are also the drivers that would prevent asset managers from uh, buying into uh, a repair solution or um, what are potential drivers that prevent asset right. managers? Well, it's, a, again, you know, as also Lucy said a few times, it's case by case, right? Um, so whether they're in the, the warranty phase or not, if they're in the warranty phase, then there's going to be very few asset owners who are going to be willing to take money out of their very limited OPEX budget and spend it when, you know, the module supplier is offering them a, a, a solution that's not going to cost them something. Now, there's additional costs, of course, with uh, uh, labor costs, restringing, re-engineering, et cetera. But those are the kinds of questions that they're trying to, to assess because, unfortunately, Uh, asset managers are often put in a situation where they have very limited OPEX budget, you know, with the pressure to, to build new plants and, and uh, at the, the lowest LCOEs, as discussed in the previous panel. Uh, there's all this pressure being put on uh, at the early stages of new projects where those that inherit the projects as asset managers are often put in the situation where they have limited budgets and really need to be convinced, not just technically, but of course also commercially. I would be very curious to hear Lucy's comment on this. Yeah. Lucy, what do you yes. think? So I think what could prevent an asset manager from, from going for a, a repair, uh, what could prevent an asset manager from going to a repair strategy is because he's just had a problem. So he is obviously risk averse. Um, the problem is uh, the panels that he got on site were tested according to IEC, sometimes two or three times IEC, and we got into this situation. So it doesn't actually make too much sense. Um, it, it's, it's an intuitive uh, um, a barrier that the asset manager will not accept to repair the panels. But the panels have performed. If the panel perform fine on site, you know they're working. Okay. This is not something that you know from the new panels that will be installed. So that's the first thing. Your, your return on, on your field experience in this case is important. Are your panels performing okay? Besides the back sheet cracking, are they okay? And if they're okay, well, then just keep them. Okay. Um, so the cost also is an important parameter to consider here. Some... Um, Asset managers may want to revamp um, an asset. So they want to, because we know we've got year-on-year -year degradation. Uh, after 10 years, you might have lost, if you're lucky, you might have lost uh, 8%. So you want to get back to your initial production. So you're going to revamp. Many contracts will prevent you from going beyond this, and many contracts will prevent you from putting new panels in place unless you've got a safety concern, which is the case for back sheet cracking, you've got a safety concern. So I think it's, it's a case-by-case -case scenario. Um, the arguments that are often put to, to the asset manager um, are sometimes uh, not based on scientific evidence or technical evidence. And we all know we, we act a lot of on impulse and emotion, but uh, the scientific thing here is to check what you've got. Is it working? If it's working, then um, it's like having a, a good car. My door is, uh, is not shutting properly anymore. I'm not going to re replace the, the car. The car is working Uh, fine, I just want to replace the door. Just a short question on this, Lucy. Is the, but it, I mean, the question is, is there scientific evidence already? I mean, you have shown your, 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 your concept. Um, is there, I mean, Stephen has also mentioned some, some points. He, he would ask for clarity. Is there scientific evidence? So a lot of tests and so on? 
So for me, the scientific evidence is in the field. Okay, I, I always trust the field first uh, rather than the lab uh, or above the lab, I trust the field. Okay, so if your installation is working properly, then it's good. Okay, you just fix the back sheet. After that, we've got also the return on experience on, on Tedler based back sheets, for example, which, on which the, the repair tape is based. So you've got this return on experience, you know that it's going to last 30 years. We did some additional lab testing, obviously, but we do have scientific evidence and technical evidence that th this is a robust solution. Um, we have one last question, and maybe you both can answer uh, uh, this question, uh, uh, maybe briefly, because we are lagging a little bit in time. Um, but um, in the end, uh, it's also down to um, the warranty terms that apply for that project. And um, these are unilaterally decided by the module supplier. Uh, so in the end, it's down to them also to make the decision to go for such a repair option. Um, how can they be motivated to buy into this solution? And why would they do that? And why would they not be interested? Maybe you two can, can answer one after the other. So, so Maybe. Let, let me answer yep. it first. Um, for the module maker, it, at the current time of um, uh, with the, the power of the panels we're trying to replace, so say 240 watts for 10 years old panels, uh, the module maker, it's going to cost him about half the price uh, to go for a repair rather than a replace. As the power categories are going to increase in time because we're going to have repair on, on newer panels, um, the cost position will become better and better because the cost is based on the panel, not on the uh, installed capacity or, or on the watt peak of the panel. So there is a strong uh, financial incentive for the module maker. Yeah, maybe just to, to add on the on the warranty claims, as, as Lucy mentioned, many of the old warranties, there, there was that unilateral uh, power to make the decision uh, in, in terms of the, the module supplier to decide to repair, replace, or, or give some kind of commercial uh, refund. Um, and, and that's one of the things as a lessons learned taking forward uh, that we constantly are pushing our, our customers to, to fight for in their negotiations with module suppliers to not just take that, that standard warranty condition that uh, all of them are actually offering, but to actually get some kind of um, decision decision-making power also given to both parties. So it's so really a mutually agreed method. Um, and I think in that case, the, the, clearly the buyer is in a better position uh, today on this hot uh, module market, supplier market that we're in. Uh, perhaps it's, it's more challenging, but you'd be surprised when you ask for things, uh, what, you're, what you're able to get. And I think this experience with back sheets, um, you know, is something that we should take as a lessons learned going forward for new projects. Thank you very much, uh, Lucy Garoyel from DuPont and Steve Shurep uh, from PI Berlin for coming online to stage and discuss with us backsheet failures and repairs. Uh, it was my pleasure having you here and hopefully you can stick around for a little bit longer uh, and discuss with the audience in the Meet the Speaker networking session later on. There are heaps of questions left, as I can see. Um, maybe you can discuss with them. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. We will continue our program with projects that are a little bit older. And it isn't just backsheets that are degrading over time. Other components are also known to suffer from uh, much, uh, to suffer some much faster than expected. Inverters are particularly tricky, as they need to be carefully selected to meet the specific site's layout and electrical requirements. Um, and when they break down or underperform, replacing them isn't always such an easy task, as it can entail a bigger electrical redesign of the whole array. Ariel Re is an, an insurance company that also underwrites newly revamped projects. How they do that and what the most common challenges and solutions are on the market, we will hear now. George Schulz is the Vice President for Clean Energy at The Underwriter, and he has brought with him some interesting insights. Welcome, George. Thank you, Marion. How are you? Good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, so uh, I'll just briefly go through some, um, I was asked to share some of our experiences in the market that we've been asked to ensure uh, repowering plants and some of the pitfalls and um, successes we've seen as well. Um, I'll, I'm gonna go share my screen and I'll get to a, a brief case study uh, as soon as possible so we can get into the discussion. So um, very briefly, um, Ariel Re is part of the Lloyds of London Syndicate. So we enjoy high ratings and global licenses in order to do our business. Uh, specifically within the Ariel Re uh, uh, business, we are the clean energy team is a global team that provides uh, specialty long-term insurance solutions for a variety of uh, renewable and clean technology risks. Um, we've been underwriting solar since 2009. <clears throat> And, um, and we've uh, been able to apply these products in a variety of different settings. And we think repowering um, uh, is, is just another um, transgression of, of uh, the way we would, we would uh, underwrite these risks. Um, this is just a brief overview of the different products that we underwrite and that we provide to the market. We'll focus specifically on how we would adapt our PV project or system performance cover to repowering uh, setting. We've, we've already provided this for O&M providers and project developers and owners. So, and we're also very active in the uh, solar module warranty backstop space. So um, about, uh, uh, so this is the product specifically, as I mentioned on the left side of the screen is the component replacement or the warranty backstop that we do for uh, module um, suppliers as well as their customers. And on the right side is a more holistic uh, pro production guarantee or revenue shortfall guarantee that enables uh, investors and project sponsors to uh, leverage our high ratings in order to protect returns on investment. <clears throat> so in the repowering space, um, probably about three years ago, we were began to be approached about whether we would ensure um, repowered pro projects or portfolios. And I think the challenge there is, well, what do you mean by repowering? And so, uh, so what we've seen is that um, uh, various uh, asset managers and owners are taking advantage of the backward compatibility of solar technologies, enable them to use the existing footprint to revamp or repower their, their plants. So, um, I mean, the most, the most obvious example is that today's module manufacturers claim upwards of 400 watts um, with 23% plus efficiency that compared to, you know, uh, a few years ago was more, more or less considered obsolete um, technologies. So there's, they're taking advantage of that. Um, as, as Marion mentioned, the inverter technologies uh, and suppliers uh, uh, have come up with more uh, favorable warranty terms than in the past. And I think the key is to reduce their first year annual uh, degradation factors. So, so what we've seen from, from some of the folks we spoke to who have been um, actively uh, repowering or um, buying portfolios with the uh, keen eye to repower portfolio plants is that they can they think they can translate up to 10 or 15% increase on the IRRs with as much as a 40% lift in the actual installed power. Uh, some of the things we've seen is that they're taking advantage, at least in this, I'm, I'm based in the US, so I'm, I'm seeing mostly from a US perspective, they're taking advantage of the current incentive programs, for example, um, introducing energy storage to complement um, some of the existing solar plants and enables them to um, open up uh, entirely new revenue streams that they can also uh, increase the asset valuation. Um, the insurer's role as Ariel Re is to, um, is to ensure that those additional revenue streams, the revamped, the repowered plant technologies um, are, are able to, um, are reliable and, and will backstop, underwrite that to make sure that the investments and the, uh, the initiatives are, are sound. A specific case that, um, and, and 
well, it's not it's it's specific but generic at the same time because we had to uh, be be sensitive about confidentiality. So we've developed this general case study based on a variety of of opportunities we've seen. Um, in this particular case, uh, this is a one particular plant that was part of a much larger CNI portfolio, but I think gave some insight to um, what this particular asset manager was doing in order to take advantage of of um, uh, new technologies. So in this case, uh, on the right side, we see uh, one particular site where the original meter was at 10 megawatts. What did they do and what was their power strategy? Well, they were uh, their plan was to replace all the existing modules with um, 400 tier one uh, modules that were replacing, let's say, 275 watt. Um, we also like that we saw that they're replacing obsolete or out of warranty inverters. Um, as the insurer, we were, when we're asked to insure these portfolios, we don't necessarily want to step in and be the warranty provider. So we think that's a good strategy as well. And of course, they're using the existing rack and other infrastructure. So in this particular case, we would look at uh, insuring up to, let's say, 95% of the pre-agreed expected energy production, um, perhaps non cancelable for 15 years. Um, I think... <clears throat> In conclusion, when we look at what we would underwrite and how we underwrite is getting back to that, what, what are we insuring? And, and the key points that we're looking at here is what is the repowering strategy? What are they doing? I think in, in the past, we saw cases where there was not a lot of um, depth or um, um, methodology behind how they were powering. They're just saying, we're going to buy a distressed asset and make it work. So... I think it's important for us to understand that if there are going to be um, upward lift of, of these, you know, they boast up to 40% and IRRs that, that support that, that we want to be sure that, that we are um, verifying that along with the O&M provider and perhaps with third party, um, third party IEs as well. So um, I'll conclude with that point and hopefully that is a jumping point to continue the discussion. George Schultz, everybody, underwriting as a proof of methodology for revamping. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation, and uh, you'll be back in a few minutes uh, here for our last panel discussion of the day. Um, but coming up next, uh, we have Michael Heidenreich. Uh, he is the senior sales manager projects at Goodwies European branch. Uh, Michael will share with us his technical considerations and risks uh, that should be considered before revamping. Welcome, Michael. Hello, Marian. Thank you very much for inviting us and welcome all in the audience. To give you a short introduction about Goodby, may some of you don't know us, may some of you know us already. We are a fast growing company. Uh, we are more than 10 years on the market. We uh, do have uh, uh, been on the uh, um, Shanghai Stock Exchange since uh, last year. And thanks to our quality, we have got a lot of recognitions by different uh, authorities and different departments. You can see this here. To give you a short overview about our products, uh, we have products for residential, hybrid, and um, utility solutions and CNI. The red ones are usually for utility and CNI projects, and the white ones are usually for residential and uh, Power, what you can get from us is from 700 watt to 250 kilowatt and depends on your need, then you can either also get uh, transformer stations and monitoring devices. Yeah, our topic for the day is, uh, is there really black and white? What should be taken into consideration in the discussion, commercial topics, technical topics? Um, what can I facing to uh, technique wise? There are some issues uh, with them with the equipment what you have selected in the past and so on. And this will come now. You will have usually some of potential courses on your site that you uh, can lead you into failures. For example, you can have fire, you can have a thunderstorm. You can have sunlight, it's, uh, you can have hail, uh, you can have uh, uh, snow, rain, whatever, pollution, dust. 
this leads uh, to aging, this leads mayo to corrosion, and on the end you you will lose yield, and uh, you want to like to prevent this. That's why um, it's uh, sometimes helpful to have a look on on your yield uh, uh, in comparison to your uh, forecast, which was uh, done some years ago, maybe. And may you come to the conclusion to change uh, your system. And then the question is, does it make sense to, to change my running system? Um, because uh, the, 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 the availability is not anymore so there, or the warranty is not anymore there. You may have not any service department there. Do you have spare parts available? And so on. And uh, for example, is, is your mean time between failure or your mean time to repair still acceptable for you because all those topics could lead to uh, reduce reduce your yield and also bring down your availability. And when you may change the equipment, then you could also get back a warranty. And so it could lead you into a uh, uh, time running that your system will be valid until the end of the, of the planned operation. Technique-wise, take into account that uh, equipment is not a, a meaning equipment for example um, in the in the older days let's say we had systems until 1000 volt now it's usually to have 1100 or 1500 volts um, inverter in the former times usually have been uh, central inverters now uh, often projects will be used with uh, string inverters also for re ramping then we should have a deeper look into the module voltage. What you have to be there is there modules used or shall, shall be the modules used which are uh, still on site or do you want to also replace the modules? Then we uh, should look on the MPP voltage either on the older or on the new modules. We should have a look on the transformers also on the cabling. For example, why on the transformers, maybe you have a string in, uh, central inverters uh, installed, then it could be happen that the voltage of the transformer is lower than the actual voltage of the string inverters. So maybe there's also end replacement of the of the uh, transformer needs. Yeah, and with new um, string inverters, you may also don't need any more in string box, so because the the string inverters actually are more or less fuseless. Yeah, and on the end, feel free if you have any questions to ask us. We are fine to help you. And uh, thank you very much and take care. Thanks, Michael, for this impulse. Uh, let's see if our panelists share similar ideas. Jörn Hackbart is the Executive Vice President and Global Head of Engineering and Construction at the in independent power producer and asset manager Sonadix. Uh, and of course, as I said before, we are welcoming back George Schulz of Ariel Re onto the panel. Hello, nice to meet you. All right, let's start. Um, Let's begin with an imaginary case. Uh, let's imagine there's a project in southern Spain, uh, maybe near Seville, uh, with a five megawatt with five megawatt power capacity. Uh, it was built in 2006 with central inverters. Um, the original manufacturer of the inverter doesn't exist anymore, and the asset manager says uh, they are sending own M crews all the time there. Uh, Jan, what would you do? Um, it's a very interesting case because, as you know, Spain, from the old projects, there's capacity payment. So you are not getting for a produced energy being incentivized. But normally, let's say, if you have a proper um, contract and you're paid for the electricity you pay, we would do a proper analysis. So um, understand the equipment. Um, and if you think over at that time, a central inverter might be 100 kilowatt. And today, as we know, string inverters have a much more higher capacity. So first of all, uh, we would study the case um, as similar as you have an old car. One day you come to the point, do I buy a new one or do I repair it? And we would do a proper uh, detailed design engineering study uh, because it's not just easy anymore to go in the shop and buy the same inverter. Uh, and for sure not a central inverter, so which equipment can be there. You will get voltage levels, uh, issues, um, how many panels are in series, 
etc cetera, etc cetera. so based on this we will do first as i said a detailed engineering study cost analysis to see what is the benefit uh, long term for our asset and and michael maybe do you want to add has has you said anything that uh, you would consider or um, would you think about something else as well also the information of Jung was already well also you should always take into account what what you want to have and what you want to get and uh, replacing of uh, inverters is now more or less standard and uh, as i mentioned before check check your module voltage check uh, check your system voltage then look on the mbpt of, of the potential inverters and potential equipment of the monitoring and so on and then just do it on the end, it will help you to cover your in invest, yeah. Yes, George, um, I, I mean, we just heard that exchanging components is standard, but let's assume that it's maybe somebody, it's, it's not a given fact for a plant. Um, what about assets where the components are either out of warranty or out of warranty or the supplier is no longer in business? Should these components be replaced per rule in order to be injured, or can they be also excluded? I mean, you know, as as the uh, the risk taker, I mean, I think the answer would would clearly be that we would we would um, they would have to make a very compelling reason why they would not replace out of warranty, or um, or um, the suppliers are no longer there. I mean, we're open to listen, but I think. Um, the point is that we don't want to step in the shoes as being a warranty provider. We are a warranty backstop provider. And I think it would benefit everyone if they had uh, the, the benefit of, of um, new technologies, better warranty terms, and a supplier that is standing behind that warranty. I think in the past, as, as the other panelists have said, I think inverters were more or less a, a throwaway technology. So not the case anymore. And I think... Um, I think that would be uh, that would be our our position unless we could be really proved proven otherwise. Um, to go in the same di direction, Michael, um, let's assume again where you have not already decided to exchange everything. You said you are saying also that asset owners asset owners with revamping aspirations must identify what is really going wrong with the asset and what they really want to achieve and. There I'm a bit wondering, let's let's go back to this five megawatt example Marian mentioned. Um, what difference could it make to set as primary target to improve either yield or return on invest or internal rate of return or availability? I mean, at the end, all of these metrics are going to improve the, pl the plant and this, that doesn't that come to the same, does, doesn't one come to the same result? Um, strongly yes and no. <laughs> Depends on the, uh, as, you, uh, as you already told, in the uh, 10 years ago, we usually installed central inverters. Uh, now more and more uh, string inverters are coming to use for, and uh, so the efficiency is higher of the, of the new inverters because uh, Due to the aging, the, the, the equipment will not deliver any more so many uh, to your grid. The, you could have failures in the equipment that you have to uh, permanently doing any any service. That you uh, that the efficiency is not so well of the equipment anymore. For example, some central inverters had in the past transformers inside, so there is the the efficiency. For example, 65 only anymore, and now uh, usually. At, in inverters have 98 or 99 percent, and and uh, for say for example service, if you have an an, an service contract before in, in in hands and and the service company doesn't exist anymore, with, uh, to whom you have signed the contract, so you have to think on how to how to make sure that your plant will running. Okay, um, George, you're in the business of underwriting uh, revamping operations. Um, what are the additional information that you would require to do that? And, and is there something that you particularly look out for? I mean, if, if Michael tells you, uh, I have revamped uh, this site and it has now high availability or the IRR has been approved, I, aren't you just going to believe him and not write the, the operation? Uh, no, no. And I think, you know, I, I kind of go back to some of our historical perspective on this is that, um, 
Um, you know, I think there were cases in the past where some of the, the approaches came to us said, well, we're, we bought this non-performing asset and we just, we have a great reputation. We're, we're going to make it work with what's there. But when we would go through the portfolio, um, the whole market knew that there were, or anyone who would look at that would know that there are certain modules or certain components that it wasn't, um, if they were going to go bad, it was when they're going to go bad. Um, so, so what I'm hearing and learning more today is that there's a much more um, coherent strategy on how revamping is going to be accomplished. And then the other side of that equation, as you mentioned, is exactly that, is, is how, how will um, those translate to higher RRs and the, uh, the revenue streams which we would need to verify um, through 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 that. In some cases, we've seen some asset managers engage um, reputable third-party um, IEs to to verify what those streams um, will be. So the two reasons, and is it just the two reasons that it can go wrong? It's that either the wrong um, uh, components have been chosen uh, for replacement, which, which have a bad track record in, in your databases, uh, or also the assumption um, of the IR improvement has been made on wrong on a wrong premise. Uh, I wouldn't say it's 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 necessarily wrong, but maybe maybe too aggressive. Um, so so that's where we'll focus on the the feasibility of those IRRs and the revenue streams and the, the energy lift that's behind them. Yeah, and I mean, we, we, it seems that uh, all of you are um, very much in favor of revamping and of replacing. Um, but let you ask you the other way around. What would need to happen for you to not consider revamping at the site? Do you have examples for this? Uh, yes, and maybe from you before you mentioned, a lot of people would believe when you just say the inverter is the issue and it's from 2006 by just changing. <coughs> Normally we can say without great uh, knowledge, availability should be increased. IRR, not necessarily because you also need to invest in new inverters. And uh, like usually when you start renovating your house, you start with the tiny stuff and you will find more and more things. So it's sometimes um, not even by, by only the inverter, you come to the transformer, you come uh, along the way to other things you wish also to touch and to adjust, especially also uh, maybe to get very closely to your questions. There might be regulatory changes uh, required, law. Um, in some countries, you cannot touch the inverter without permission from the uh, authorities. Otherwise, you would uh, kind of fortify your feed-in tariff from the past. So there's a lot of uh, um, not even technically, but also, I would say, legal engineering required. Uh, nevertheless, uh, sometimes even the lenders need also to get the approval in. So it's not only you make a technical decision, you also need to go into your uh, financing credit agreements and uh, taking the regulation laws into consideration. So based on this, we are not repairing all our sites. Um, another the reason for this, could it be that, for example, if if you are in a region where you have a feed-in tariff and the feed-in tariff is short, before expir exp uh, is short before expiring, would you then also revamp and consider a different business model like financing with the PPA or maybe in the near future also adding an electrolyzer and producing hydrogen? Or maybe a bit different is the situation which George described that he adds storage. That's the yes situation where you then can maybe increase the value of the of, of the electricity. Um, so I would first go for with Jörn for this, and then maybe also to listen to George what he used to say. Yeah, pleasure. So in general, um, first question is: Do you own the land, or you just have a lease contract? So if you own the land, then you're safe. If you have a 30 years lease and you're like at year 25 and five years to go, then you have a question, what do you do with that? So of course, if your tariff is over, but you own the piece of land, like with every owner, uh, you think over how you can um, improve your revenues, which means storage, uh, hydrogen, uh, other services you can offer. 
uh, maybe even um, adding in other uh, plants, more power plant controllers, giving option to the grid, um, other technologies. Um, so all of this you need to take into consideration. Maybe a very short answer by George, because we have to go move forward. Sure. I, I mean, I'll just refer back to the case study where, um, you know, there was taking advantage of certain pro programs that, for example, introducing storage enabled them to reset and then blend the existing PPAs. And so we'd be willing to look at those, those new revenue streams as long as they're supportable. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your participation and your time today. It was an absolute pleasure having you on the program. And uh, maybe our audience can see some of you later in the Meet the Speaker session uh, in a few minutes as we're ending the session. Thank you. That was it. That was the first day of our Roundtables Europe. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in and participating. Uh, please don't forget uh, that we have a Meet the Speaker session lined up for you right after this. Also, there are other networking opportunities waiting for you. Uh, this, of course, does include uh, the German language networking session on hydrogen with our senior editor, Sandra Enkert. Uh, again, this was day one of our roundtables, so there is a day two tomorrow. Uh, we hope to see you again. Uh, we have another two cornerstones prepared for you, uh, and we will start at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. with a session on sustainability and made in Europe. Uh, Jonathan Gifford has put together a program taking into focus the challenges and opportunities of Europe's upstream solar sector. And in the afternoon, from 2 p.m., Michael, you have prepared another cornerstone. Yes, um, tomorrow at 2 p.m. we will have our Innovation Hub roundtable session. Innovation Hub because we will discuss how solar project developers and investors can make business opportunities related to hydrogen and storage. We will also have there two project developers who are going in this hydrogen business and concerning battery storage we see a big discrepancy that scientists tell us we need a lot of it. It's really a cornerstone of the energy transition, but except some countries and segments, it's not so dynamic in Europe, for example, if you compare it to the US. And we want to know whether this will change soon and whether also the business opportunities will open in this sphere. While you're waiting until tomorrow, why not pass some time checking out our latest edition? Uh, you can get a 10% discount on this edition. Just use the code ROUNDTABLES10. Uh, and you can also find a link to the edition, of course, on our website, but also here on this event app. Uh, a special thanks again to our partners for making this event possible. Uh, our platinum partners, DuPont, Goodwe, and Jinko Solar, uh, you have seen here in this session. But of course, as well, Ariel Re, uh, Media Control, um, have sponsored the event. Unfortunately, they had to cancel their participation, uh, but we're very grateful that they were trying to participate. PI Berlin and Next Tracker, you have also seen in this session. Thank you to you all, uh, unless we forget our gold and silver partners. Um, we hope you enjoyed today's program and can see you again tomorrow. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.